Hello, and welcome to week seven of our covenant study. Now, we're looking at tonight specifically chapter 12, and we're going to kind of highlight just the following chapters, but we're going to chapter 19 and chapter 24. Those are going to be our main chapters that we're going to look at. We'll also look at um, chapter 32 as well. So I want to go ahead and get right into the study. And I wanted to give you a little bit of background because in chapter 12, we're opening up with the 10th plague. All right. God has gone through systematically. Egypt was a nation that had at the very top a Pharaoh who was worshipped himself as God. And they worshipped many gods. God was systematically, he'd gone through the land, the waters, everything, and showing them the whole purpose of it was that he may show that he is the Lord. Now, we know um, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. I want to pick up with Terry Lee Cobble's commentary on Exodus 10 through 12, and I want to just read that from her book, um, The Bible Recap, for just a moment, just to give you a little bit of background. She says here, she says, <clears throat> it almost sounds like part of God's plan is to harden Pharaoh's heart against his plan. He uses the wicked as a tool to advance his plan and bless his kids. And you know what? Throughout history, we've seen God do that. The truth is difficult and mysterious, and it's okay to not understand it fully yet, or maybe ever. But we can't cut it out of scripture. We have to see how it fits in. We've seen several places where God pardoned Pharaoh's heart. And a few say that his heart was hardened and a few that attribute the hardening to Pharaoh himself. But interestingly, she says, Pharaoh's hardening of his own heart is almost always followed with the statement, as the Lord had said. It can feel threatening to realize God is bigger than our hearts, that he can shape them for his own purposes. It's important not to let fear drive that thought. The enemy of your soul wants you to view God's power through a lens that pushes you away from him instead of drawing you in. So instead of thinking of thinking how comforting it is to know a God that powerful, Satan wants to push you away from God. He wants to repel you. But if you will instead think in place of those thoughts, how wonderful to worship, to love, to know a God that is that powerful you probably know and love people she writes who are far from god people that you prayed for and cried for people that have told you they never want to hear another word about god again he can soften their hearts and turn them on their heels and that's what he did with the apostle paul who wasn't just not seeking god but he was actively at war against god and his people for God to be sovereign over sins and hearts means no one is beyond his reach. And it's never too late. That is a comfort. That is a comfort. So she goes on to say that Pharaoh's resolve begins to weaken. But instead of obeying, he asks for a compromise and God turns him down. Locust and darkness come, but still no repentance. Then God sends what he knows is the final plague. Moses has the Israelites ask the Egyptians for their valuables. That's gold, silver, fine linen, etc. He tells them to sacrifice the lamb, sprinkle its blood on the left side and the right side in the top of their doorways, marking their homes and their families by the blood of a sacrifice. Interestingly, because of the blood that drips to the ground from the top of the doorway, this forms the shape of a cross. God says to eat dinner quickly. They were to eat it in haste, weren't they? Don't make bread that rises. He told them, do not put the leaven. The leaven would make the bread rise. But he said, do not add leaven to the bread. Now, the symbolism of leaven throughout the Bible is sin. They were to take all the leaven out of their homes. They were to cleanse everything. And then they were to make the bread without it. They were to take the lamb. They were to slaughter it, prepare it, roast it on the day of the 14th. Now, Jewish days began at sundown. So all this was done on the 14th. And then at sundown, it became the 15th. And on the 15th of April, God was going to lead them out. 
the prophecy that he had given Jeremiah 430 years prior, God was fulfilling that very night. He was bringing Abraham's descendants who had been in a foreign land, Egypt, who had been enslaved out of their bondage. And he would be leading them himself. We'll see that. So here we are. We see that <clears throat> he tells them to stay fully dressed. He says he has planned a dinner party. And this is back going back to Tara Cobble's book. He says he has planned a dinner party to celebrate what he's about to do. And he's already telling them how to commemorate his deliverance before he fulfills it. Jewish people around the world still celebrate this event. And the Hebrew calendar is built around it. It's called Passover because God passes over the houses that are marked with blood, keeping them all alive. So on the doorpost, left side, right side, and the lentil above, if they had the blood of the lamb, they were to dip hyssop into blood and then put it on the doorpost. If their house had blood, then when he came through, he would pass over their house. But for those that did not have the blood of the lamb, the firstborn son would die. Also, the firstborn of their livestock or of every beast. So he was not only going to be striking down Pharaoh's firstborn son, but every Egyptian's firstborn son and the firstborn of the livestock. Now, she says here <clears throat> that his identity is questionable because most signs point to it being a theophany. That's specifically a Christophany. Now, in our live class, because we had so many things to cover, I didn't want to give the dual side of this. But Bible scholars, like on many subjects in the Bible, you will see, some agree and some disagree at this particular passage about who this actually was. Some believe, like I um, put forward last night, that the destroying angel or the destroyer was totally separate from Christ. But then there are others who believe that it was Christ himself. Well, here's the thing, and I want to take you back to something in Exodus real quick, because one of the things that I explained in notes, in the study form, in the notes of uh, this week's study, was the fact that Moses was called by his wife, Zipporah, a bridegroom of blood, or translated out, a bloody husband. She said, you are a bloody husband to me. And what was she talking about? Well, every Hebrew boy was to be circumcised on the eighth day. Apparently, and I've read many commentaries, apparently Moses did that with his firstborn son, Gershon. But Zipporah found the whole process appalling. Apparently, she didn't want the second son, Eleazar, circumcised. But when Moses was called to go into Egypt, and he would be delivering, God was sending him as the deliverer and the mediator, the mediator of a new covenant that he would cut with the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. Abraham was the patriarch. The covenant passed to Isaac, and then it passed to Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons by two wives, Leah and Rachel, and their handmaids. So 12 sons by four women. And those 12 sons formed the 12 tribes of Israel. And from them, the nation multiplied. And like God had taken Abram out one night, and he says, look up at the stars and see if you can count the stars. That is how great your descendants will be. Look at the sand. Can you count all of the sand? Your descendants. And you will be blessed and you will be a blessing to all nations. So here's this nation now that he's finally pulling out of this bondage and he's going to make them, he calls them my people. They would be a holy nation and they were to be set apart, consecrated from all other nations. They were not to mix by marriage with the neighboring nations. So. But going back to this particular incident here, when Moses was on the way to Egypt, he took Zipporah, his wife, and his two sons. But what happened? Well, let's go back, and we're going to look at Exodus chapter 4, 
real quick. We're not going to take much time on this, but we want to see something because I want to put forward a thought, just a suggestion, and then you pray about it and see what the Lord tells you. Okay, so in verses 18 through 26, okay, then Moses departed and returned to his father, uh, Jephro, his father-in-law, and he said to him, please let me go that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt. So he experienced the living God in the burning bush. And so he says to his father-in-law, who was the priest of Midian, I need to go back. I'm being called back to deliver my brethren. And watch what his father-in-law has to say. He says, who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. He didn't fight him. He didn't fight him. He said, now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead because he killed, he had killed an Egyptian. When he was 40 years old, he went out to check on his brethren. They were enslaved, working, and the Egyptians were hard taskmasters. And so he rose up and killed one. But here's the thing. That was the first 40 years of Moses. He would then spend 40 years after he fled Egypt in the wilderness. He would spend 40 years in the wilderness Midian. He married Zipporah. He had these two sons. Now, so Moses is going back. He's been called back. He says, you don't have to fear those men because they're all dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and he mounted them on a donkey and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Now, you can see about that in prior chapters where he was showing Moses the wonders that he would do through him. Lay the staff down and it became a serpent. All right, put his hand in his um, robe and it was white as snow. He had, was, had leprosy. So he gave him signs to show him, I will be with you. Then you shall say, then Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt and see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Now he's talking about Israel as the nation, as a nation and whole, my firstborn. They were the first covenant people. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now it came about at the lodging place on the way or the inn where they stayed. that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Now, the Lord. Okay. And that's all capital letters. So we know that's Yahweh. Well, the one that came in pre-existent form was Christ. It was a Christophany. So why was he seeking his life? Well, he struck him with an illness and Moses could have died. But what happened? In verse 25, Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. And at that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, although she didn't like the process, she fully realized that her sons would have to be in covenant. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant given to Abraham. And so if she had not done that, if she had not been obedient, then her son would have died. Moses very well could have died from the illness that he was struck with. Now, he then is sent on by the Lord to go and meet Aaron in the wilderness. And Zipporah and her sons go back to Midian. They're reunited later, but that just kind of gives you a little bit of a background. If the Lord was going to strike Moses down with an illness that could have killed him, and he was going to come after his son, because otherwise Eleazar would have been cut off from covenant, then would he not? possibly have been the one that went through Egypt I'm just presenting that he very well could have been as some scholars believe now you can read many commentaries and you're going to find in the Bible that there's going to be things that they just agree it's not a hill to die on, okay it's neither here nor there what we do know is that the destroyer did go through Egypt 
and it was blood, the blood of the lamb. And what was that? Just like Isaac taking um, um, Abraham, taking Isaac to Mount Moriah. When God told him to and instructed and he did all that he was told. And we see that Isaac himself, a 25 year old man, was completely and totally obedient. We see that it was a foreshadowing. Well, what was happening here? All right. Through the blood of the lamb, we see a foreshadowing of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world on a cross on Calvary, laying down his life once and for all. No further sacrifice was ever needed. Now, Orthodox Jews continued sacrificing until AD 70, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and that brought about the dispersion of the Jewish people. And they didn't come back into the land till 2,000 years later, nearly 2,000 years later. In 1948, they were declared a nation in a day, fulfilling the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37, the Valley of the Dry Bones. We don't have time to go into that. We may have a prophecy seminar um, sometime. But here's the thing. Here we see Christ. What was he called? One of the things we're going to see that Christ was called, he was the messenger of the covenant. He was the mediator. Where Moses was the mediator of the old covenant, or as Jewish people knew it, the law, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, the covenant of grace, which all of us today, if you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, had a true salvation experience, you have repented, repented, you are following him, you are obeying his commands, following his precepts, then you are in covenant with him, the covenant of grace. So very well could have been him. Now, let's go back to chapter 12, okay? Because <clears throat> at chapter 12, we see that um, in the middle of the night, and this was shortly after midnight, in the middle of the night, two to three million Israelites flee Egypt. Now, the Bible says there were approximately 600,000 men, but they had grown in number. In fact, it was their number, the sheer number that was scaring the Egyptians, lest they overcome them. So, and plus there was other neighboring um, that were sympathetic to them. And they just thought, well, if they join with them, then they're going to totally destroy us. And that's the reason why Pharaoh started killing all the male Hebrew babies. Okay. He did that. That was inspired by Satan. Why was it inspired by Satan? Because he was trying to what? stopped the seed with the capital s the seed that was promised in genesis 3 15 he was trying to cut down the messianic line what would herod do in jesus time when jesus was born the magi came they saw the star jesus was two years old when the magi came to his home herod issues all male hebrew israelite boys all under two two and under, are to be killed. So again, Satan inspired Herod to do that because he's trying to stamp out the messianic line. He's trying before the seed, the seed, the spiritual seed of Abraham could ever crush his head. He was trying to stop the messianic line. Okay, we saw him trying to pollute it and we saw it in Noah's day. We saw what was going on in Lot's day, and we saw why God had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. While we didn't go into that, we see that Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, if there be 50 righteous men, 40, 30, 10. Now, like Abraham, he was an intercessor in the Bible. Moses would be an intercessor for his people. So two to three million people fled Egypt. Some non-Israelites joined them. And we find out later that some Egyptians went too. God says to treat them like family as long as they're circumcised. So if they wanted to be covenant people, 
they had to take the sign of the covenant. They had to be circumcised. Otherwise, the covenant terminology is cut off. If you were cut off, you are outside the will of God. Circumcised, you were in the will of God. They've been in Egypt for 430 years, okay? And 400, 400 years, they, um, she states here, that could be a generality and not a down to the minute timeline. Or the first 30 years may have included the time when Joseph first moved his family there. Because in the prophecy, he tells Abraham, know that your descendants will be enslaved in a foreign land, 400 years. So people question the discrepancy. Why 430 years? Well, this is, this is quite possibly why, because they had been there for 430 years. But don't worry, like she says, that don't worry that God's late. He's not 30 years late. He's not 30 years late. 400 could have been in generality and not down to a minute, or the first 30 years may have included the time when Joseph was there. So I did want to make sure that we all understood that. So when you see those different numbers, you understand what that might, what that might be. So in 12, we see the very last plague, chapter 12 of Exodus. We see the Passover lamb, what they were to do. We see that, that actually it was set up as a memorial of redemption, okay? He says in verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Now, that is why there's two schools of thought. But nevertheless, like I said, the thing that we need to know is that it was the blood. It's the blood that saves. It was the blood on Calvary. And we're going to see that because next week we start to study on the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is a picture of Christ. We're going to see where the blood went. All right. Now, and you shall observe this as an ordinance. This was not a one time event. Jews, Orthodox Jews today, observe the Passover. It's the beginning of the religious year, okay, for the Jewish people. And so the Feast of Passover, that was on April 14th, our time frame. Then on April 15th at sundown, beginning at sundown, the beginning of a new day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were to make that bread. It was to have no yeast in it whatsoever because they were going to be fleeing in haste. And here they are. Here they are. They are fleeing. So you see the exodus of Israel starting in verse 33. Now, the firstborn, there was wailing throughout the night because parents discovered that their firstborn son had been killed. And the firstborn of their livestock, the beast, had been killed. And it says here in verse 29 that it was about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Think about that. Every house in Egypt was affected, even the one that they worshiped as God, Pharaoh. You know, in the book of Isaiah, God states numerous times, there was no other God but me. There is none other. There is one true God, and his name is Jehovah, Yahweh. There are no other gods. Now, <clears throat> he's the one true God. So when you see in verse 33, the Exodus, you see that they left. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up in the clothes on their shoulders. Now, the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor. Now, we know that Noah found favor, and we certainly know that Abraham had favor. So favor, the favor of God is everything. It's everything. They gained favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they let them have their request, thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now, why does God having them plunder the Egyptians? Because 
the very thing that we're going to talk about next week and the week after, the tabernacle. Those things which they took would be needed in building a dwelling place for God. He intended to dwell amongst the people. God has always had it set in his heart to be with us. One of the names of Jesus, Emmanuel, means God with us. He took on the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Godhead. Divine majesty left the glory in heaven with the Father to come to earth and wrap himself in flesh. He dwelt or he tabernacled with us. Because in the Hebrew, when you look up the word tabernacle or tabernacled, you will see that it means to dwell. Dwelt or the dwelling place of. So that's why many people believe that the Lord was born in the fall, not on December 25th. They moved it, and this is according to Jewish tradition, the date of his birth was moved to the winter solstice so that it would be celebrated. Well, like many people have said, it doesn't matter what day it is, but one day a year, we need to celebrate the birth of our Savior. But I'm on the side of, I believe it too, it was in the fall. And I think that the word tabernacle is our hint as to the time frame. Simply because if you've ever been in a desert at night, you know it's very hot in the daytime, but it's cold at night. Would the shepherds have their flock out there in that kind of weather? I mean, it gets freezing cold. So that's another clue for us. But anyway, that's just a little sidebar. So he had them plunder the Egyptians to take out of Egypt what they would need to be able to build. Now, they believe that Ramses II was the Pharaoh at this time. So <clears throat> the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkah, about 600,000 men on foot aside from children. Now that's men. But like I said, the Exodus, they've estimated two to three million people came out. That's a lot of people. 600,000 men, but you've got women and then you've got all the children they had. Well, we know that many of the families had multiple children, large families. So that estimate can be very well true, two to, two to three million people. And in verse 38, it says, it was a mixed multitude that went up with them along with flocks and herds, a very large number of livestock. And they baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread. What was God instituting? He instituted Passover as a remembrance. He instituted a Seder meal. And that's what the Orthodox Jews observe is the Seder at Passover. Okay. Now the lamb, the lamb that was to be sacrificed, the blood was to be the covering. Then he was, the lamb was roasted and it was eaten, but with bitter herbs because bitter had been their time in Egypt. They had endured hardship. In the beginning, in Joseph's time, it was great. But as they grew so numerous, Pharaoh put them to work. They built bricks and mortar, and it was backbreaking, backbreaking. And then they intensified it. So it was bitter herbs. Now, we're going to go through the Seder. So I won't go into it fully here, but we're actually going to go through it and we're actually going to see a Seder in the coming weeks. So the ordinance of the Passover was instituted. And then the 15th is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And God said for seven days, seven days you're going to observe. These were memorials forever. These were to be handed down for generation to generation forever. So like I said, not a one-time event, but something that would go on and on and on. Now, in chapter 13, you see the consecration of the firstborn, and God leads the people. All I want to say about that is basically this. Um, we do know in chapter 13 that, as, as promised, they did take the bones of Joseph with them when he said, do not leave me in Egypt. But they took the bones of Joseph. In verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear saying, God shall surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. So verse 21, we want to see, and the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud 
by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So this is a huge multitude of people and they are traveling night and day. And in verse 22, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So visibly, God manifested himself and he showed them the way. He carried him through and he brought him out to the wilderness. And there we see in chapter 14 that Pharaoh's in pursuit. And what does God do? He divides a sea, the Red Sea. He divides it and he, he goes through Moses and he to, and Moses was like no other prophet in Israel. But through Moses, he divided the Red Sea and they walked through the riverbed on dry ground. That is power. The same God that demonstrated his power through the plagues. The same God that appeared by day, by night, and led them himself. He, they are there in the wilderness, and Pharaoh's coming. He's after them. You know what? God parts a sea. He makes a Red Sea road. God makes a way where there is no way. You know the song Waymaker? Well, let me tell you something. Personally, from experience, I can tell you that I have seen in my life the evidence of God parting the Red Sea and doing things only he could do. So I can't imagine what it would be like to be there physically and see the waters being held back. But they, they walk through. Now, Pharaoh's in pursuit. And the people are starting to get afraid because he's catching up with them. But what happens is they finish crossing over to the other side. God brings the waters back and Pharaoh and his army, his chariots and his horses, drowned in the Red Sea. You know, in the new covenant, and that's the new covenant, when you receive Jesus Christ, whether you realize it or were taught this, are told this when you were saved, you enter into a covenant. But one thing, you don't have to be afraid. You have a protector and you have a defender. Jesus makes us co-heirs with him. You have everything to gain and nothing to fear. But you need to know, as we'll see with the Israelite people, that God gives blessings for those who keep covenant and he curses those who do not. So it is a solemn binding agreement. Now, he's merciful, he loves us, he always gives us an opportunity to repent and God always has a witness. We may not wanna listen, we may not wanna hear with our ears, but God always has a witness and he gives us time to repent. You see that over and over and over in the Bible. You saw it in Noah's day. 120 years. Now, no one accepted. No one believed. Only Noah and his family made it into the ark and were preserved. But everybody else had the same opportunity. So let's keep going because in verse, um, in chapter 15, you see the song of Moses and Israel. And it's actually, it was a song that was sang basically just exalting God for all that he had done, all that he had done for and on behalf of the Israelite people. And in verses 11 and 12, you see the very heart of the song itself. And it ends with the Lord will reign forever and ever. And indeed he will. He will reign forever and ever. So it celebrated his spectacular victory over Egypt, Pharaoh who professed to be a god, and was worshiped as one in all of the Egyptian gods. Now in chapter 17, we only wanna note this because you will see here in chapter 15, um, or chapter 16 rather, that the Lord provides manna. He rained bread down from heaven. So many times Jesus is called the bread of life, the bread that came from heaven. 
We're going to explore that more as we go into the tabernacle. So we won't go in depth to that right now. But we also know that he provided meat, quail, and then the institution of the Sabbath being observed six days. And on the seventh day, rest. No work is to be done whatsoever. All right. Now, these were times of testing as they're going through the wilderness. God is testing the Israelites. And you know something? Here's the problem. A lot of times we we in our current society in 2023, we look to the young people, our younger generation, as being the problem or the weak link. When in fact, clearly, in this situation, you can see it was the older people who in fact were the problem. They had grown up in Egypt. They had been in bondage and they still had that same mindset. Now, when you become a new creature in Christ, when you accept the Lord as Savior, Lord and Master, then you can't just remain there. You have to go forward. And how do you go forward? How do you spiritually mature? Through the word of God. You have to get into the word. The word teaches, it renews, causes regeneration. The Holy Spirit placed in you when you were saved, which the Holy Spirit is the promise of the new covenant. You receive the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit Himself dwells within you. You then, in agreement with Him, sit down with the word, pray pray. And so at this point, I just want to stop right now. And I want to pray. I want to pray for everyone that's in our live class, the new people that came, those that couldn't be there. I want to pray for some individuals that are on my heart right now. I see their faces, but I don't need to speak their names. God knows. I want to pray for all of you that might be watching this video that just came to the Lord recently, or maybe you're still on the fence. At this point, I wanna just stop and pray a word. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I thank you for the blood of the lamb slain for my sins, Lord, that cover and wash me white as snow. I thank you for the gift of covenant. I thank you that I'm able to keep covenant, Lord, because of your Holy Spirit within me, leading me and guiding me. I'm never alone, as you say in your word. You never leave us nor forsake us. You loved us so much, Lord Jesus, that you came so that your spirit might be with us forever and ever. Help us to be the people of covenant, the people who will honor you with the words that we say, with the deeds that we do, whether seen or unseen. Let our character always be blameless and upright before you, Lord. And for those who are not saved, possibly they're thinking about it. I pray, Father, that they won't delay. Because we know through your word that time is very, very short. And we know your heart's desire is for all to be with you in heaven. You've always desired to fellowship amongst us. And thank you, Jesus, that you provided that way through your sacrifice on Calvary. I just pray for each and every person that hears this, that this may take root, that the seed may grow, and for those that are meant to carry it forward, Lord, that they will boldly, with fervor, and that this will go out and will have a ripple effect. So many people do not understand covenant, and so many people do not know that they entered a covenant. Oh, Lord, help us to correct that. Help us to know you through your covenants, through your promises that are binding. You cannot break covenant and we can stand 
on your promises with all faith, all confidence, and all trust, Lord. I thank you. I thank you that you were willing to be that sacrifice for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we see <clears throat> that in chapter 16, in chapter 17, that there's a series of tests that the Israelites have to go through. We too are tested. Every day we're tested. You know, sometimes it can be just as simple as getting in your car and getting on the highway and somebody pulling out in front of you to just drive as slow as they possibly could. Or maybe they just pull out in front of you and go maybe 50 yards and turn off, you know? There's just little test. Are you gonna be that person that lays on the horn that, you know, screaming, yelling, saying things that shouldn't be said, hanging your head out the window? There's other things. What about when you're in there in a store? And well, the cashier is just not too friendly. What what about other situations that you're in? Sometimes our worst hurts come from those that profess to love us the most, our families, our, our loved ones. What are you going to show them? Are you going to show them Jesus, God, or are you going to show them that you're a child of the devil? We have the choice every single day, what we're going to do. So these people were tested. And this older generation, because of the way that they had been brought up, they'd been enslaved because of their really stinking thinking, okay? Um, they were very unhappy people. They were murmurers and they were grumblers. And here in chapter 17, there's an incident that we'll go into later as we get um, on the other side of the tabernacle, we go back to the second giving of the law in the book of Deuteronomy and the time of Moses' death at the end. But there was something that Moses did not get to do simply because of an event that happened right here in this chapter. When God gives you instructions, follow them to the letter. He has a reason. And one thing God does not do, one, he won't be mocked. And number two, God does not share his glory. So Moses did something and he disrespected the Lord and there were consequences for it. So we'll see that later. But in chapter 18, he's reunited with his wife Zipporah and his sons and his father-in-law comes along as well. And he gives Moses some wonderful counsel. I can tell you, I had in-laws that were like a second set of parents for me and I miss them every day, but I sought their counsel. They were older, they were wiser, and I knew that they desired the very best for us. And so don't despise wise counsel. In chapter 19, this is where we want to go to next, because now we're going to get to the heart of covenant, okay? So chapter 19 of Exodus, um, we're going to see that Moses is on Mount Sinai, and Three months they traveled through the wilderness. So in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, they came to the wilderness of the Sinai. And when they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai, camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on the eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey, obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the people for the earth is mine. The whole earth is the Lord's and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and he called the elders of the people and he set before them all the words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So they were in complete agreement. Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I shall come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. 
Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord also said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today. Now, the word consecrate means to set apart. He said, consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Now, God does things on the third day. We can look at the offering of Isaac. We can see it here. And we can see on the third day in the tomb, Jesus arose. So, three. He says, let them be ready. Now, verse 12. And you shall set bounds for the people all around saying, beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether beast or man. He shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, now that was called the shofar, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and, con and consecrated the people. They washed their garments, and he said to the people, be ready for the third day, and do not go near a woman. So it came about on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now, that's how he manifested himself, thunder and lightning and the sound of the trumpet, the ram's horn. Okay, call the shofar, blown at convocations, blown at special events. And it is that very sound that we will hear, and I believe not too far away, when the Lord returns for his bride, the church. So he says here <clears throat> in, um, in verse um, 17, Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, he is a holy God. He didn't want them to come too close because what does Hebrews say about our God? He is a consuming fire. God is holy. And so they could not come at that point into his presence. But what did Jesus do for us on Calvary? He made a way. He made a way. The Lord visits Sinai in verse 18. Now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and he called Moses to the top and Moses went up and there the Lord spoke to Moses. He said, now go down, warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. And also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou stood warn us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses goes down to the people and he told them. Now, in chapter 20, you see the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness, covenant term, to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. So obey, obey. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. What do we do in America? You can't turn the television on without hearing the Lord's name taken in vain. You can't watch a show, can't watch movies. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath 
of the Lord your God, and in it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in the six days that the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord gives you. Live your life in a way such as to bring honor to your parents. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Now, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us lest we die. They were afraid. Moses said, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you. And in order that the fear of him, the reverence, the awe, may remain with you so that you may not sin. You see, when you don't have a healthy fear of God, when you don't revere him, you don't revere his name and you take it in vain, you don't revere his commandments, his presence, there is no awe. He's just like somebody else. Listen, God loves us and he made a way for us to be in fellowship with him through his son. It is the only way, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one gets to the Father but through me. Jesus was the path. He cut the path. Now, but you have to know who you're dealing with. God is holy. Holy, holy, holy. When Isaiah saw God on his throne in Isaiah chapter six and the cherubim before the throne guarding the presence of God, holy, holy, holy. Now, I have to tell you something. We need to remember that and we need to respect the Lord our God. There's no respect for God in this world anymore. We've taken him out of schools. We've taken him out of courtrooms. We've removed him in every way that we can. We break his commandments. We shed innocent blood. That's the terminology in the Bible. Modern day abortion. But also, what else are we doing for our children? Human trafficking. Human trafficking. So Satan has devised many, many ways many ways um now so then he tells them he says thus you shall say to the sons of israel you yourselves have seen that i have spoken to you from heaven you shall not make other gods besides me gods of silver gods of gold you shall not make them for yourself so we are not to have any idols we have shows that have the word idol in it but we are not to idolize anything anything, whether it's a material possession or a person. We're not to idolize. So anyway, now he says that if you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you will your tool on it, you will profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. So he goes into chapter 21. He gives the ordinance for the people. And then you see in the following chapters, he gives laws, property rights, etc. Now in verse 20, I mean, excuse me, chapter 24, here's where we want to get to today. He affirms the covenant. Now, all this time, Israel's, I mean, Abraham's descendants, all this time, here is the moment where he's going to affirm this covenant. And the thing that you need to watch and pay attention, this one is not the same as the Abrahamic covenant. It's not the same. Yes, they had to be circumcised. That covenant is in effect. Okay. Abrahamic covenant. But this one he was making with the people, the nation of Israel. 
the sons and the daughters that had come out of Egypt, that he had delivered himself. And he said to Moses, he said, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall come worship at a distance. And then Moses alone, however, shall come near to me, near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came. So they could go up so far, but only Moses saw the Lord face to face. Now, Moses wrote down the words of the Lord, verse four. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars. So 12 stones were set up for the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what they signified. All right. In verse five, and he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. When we go into the tabernacle, we're going to talk about the different types of offerings. So Moses took half the blood, he put it in the basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. So there's blood on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant, the book of the covenant, and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, now, here it is again. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people. So half of it went on the book of the covenant and half of it went on the people. So, and they said, behold, he said, Moses said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So. There it is. The covenant is being cut. Now, Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Now, here's the thing. When God wrote on the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, in Jewish tradition, it is recorded as those stones were made of sapphire. The finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments. But here's the thing. What would happen? What would happen? Well, let's keep going. Verse 15, let's skip down there. Then Moses went up to the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst. And to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. So that's how he manifested. He is a consuming fire. He is holy. Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up. Now he was on the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. So what happens? Okay, it goes into offerings for the sanctuary in chapter 25 and the Ark of the Covenant. But we're going to talk about all of that as we go into the tabernacle. But here's the thing that I want us to get to. So it goes into every bit of that, and that's your homework reading 25 to 31. But let's jump over to chapter 32, because in the midst of him giving all of this detailed information about the tabernacle, the place where he would dwell amongst his people for 40 days and 40 nights, getting these instructions, the people have decided that, well, Moses went up. He didn't come back down. Something's happened to him. So what do they do? Well, the older generation went to Aaron and it didn't take much pressure because he caved right in and we see the golden calf chapter 32 now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain the people assembled about Aaron and said to him come now make us a God who will go before us for is this Moses the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt we do not know what's become of him <laughs> and Aaron said to them now look there's no argument he just Tear off your gold rings or turn the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters and bring them to me. So the, did, the people tore him off and they brought him to Aaron. In verse four, he takes this from their hand, fashions with it a graving tool, made it into a molten calf, and they said, this is your God. And this is what Aaron did. He said, this is your God, O Israel. This is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So all the earrings, all the gold melted down. Aaron takes a grain tool, fashions a gold calf. Here's your God. This is what led you out of Egypt. Mm. Well, okay. 
Jump down to verse seven. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. He said, now go down at once for your people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded. Twice they'd already said, we will do all that you say. We will be obedient. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out up from the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them and make, and I will make of you a great nation. So what's God fixing to do? Well, you know what? And only as he could, he very well could have wiped them all out. But you see the entreaty of Moses. You see the entreaty of Moses. And so what does that make Moses? Like Abraham, who interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, we see Moses interceding. He says, Lord God, O oh Lord, why does thy anger burn against thy people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak then saying with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy burning anger and change thy mind about doing harm to thy people. You see, Abraham had a very frank conversation. And what did God do? He listened to me. Abraham was a friend of God. <clears throat> Moses was a man unlike any other and had a relationship with God unlike any other man. What does God do? He's laid out his plea. And in verse 13, he says, remember, Moses used the words of covenant. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou didst swear by thyself, knowing that he could not break covenant, and did say to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Okay, there's more there. We can't go any further right now. But here's the thing. We do see that God does have anger. Anger is an emotion that God created, just like all the rest of them. But there is an anger that causes man or woman to sin. And that is what the New Testament warns us about, that anger that burning anger, that rage, okay? We have to be very careful there. Where is that coming from? What is the source? Satan. God tells us, be angry, but do not sin. There is a righteous anger and there's a difference. There's a huge difference. Getting angry and just saying, well, God got angry so I can get angry too. That's not gonna cut it. That's not gonna cut it. We are not like God. His ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our ways. And he tells us that in Isaiah. So we see that in chapter 33, actually Moses goes down, and he was upset, and he broke the tablets. But then he goes back up to the mountain, and God again writes with the finger of God the Ten Commandments. and comes back down, and the journey resumes. And so in um Chapter 34, that's when you see that the two tablets are replaced and then um, the covenant is renewed. And you see that when Moses comes down, his face is shining. Now, that is the glory of the Lord. And there's a picture in that. So we'll talk about that picture later because it has to do with a new covenant. It was a picture of something, of one fading and another taking over one becoming obsolete and another. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. Jesus was the mediator, is the mediator of the new covenant. So we've covered quite a lot today. And in our class, live class, we had some questions that um, I did not give any study notes on the lesson this time. I gave study notes on the name of Yahweh revealed in I am that I am. I gave study notes on the bridegroom of blood so that that would be understood. But in the live class, I only produced 
chapters with the subtitles of what was going on in those chapters. And then we had two pages of questions and review. And so for those of you in our live class, you'll be able to get those um, or any of you that are uh, watching on the video. I'll just tell you this. It was an examination of chapter 19. Look for covenant. Look for what God is telling them in verses three through six. Look to who, whom God is speaking to his people. He used Moses. And what did that make Moses? It made him a mediator. Where were they camped? Mount Sinai. What was the response of the people? They will do all that God commands. They will be obedient. All right. And then um, in verse, um, in Exodus 20 through 23 chapters, God's words were given to Moses, to his people. In chapter 20, you see the Ten Commandments. But according to Exodus 23, verses 27 through 33, what was the relationship of the children of Israel to be with those living in Canaan? They were to have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with those living in Canaan. No relationship at all. They were to be consecrated. They were to be set apart. And then we broke down chapter 24, verses 1 through 18. What we were looking for, and we were identifying these in the different verses, and where an altar with 12 pillars is set up, where a sacrifice is made, where the blood sacrifice is divided, when the blood, when the blood is applied to the people, and behold God, eat and drink. And then the people agree to obey covenant. Now, I also said that you could read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 18 through 20, for a commentary on the 24th chapter of Exodus, verses six through eight. So to note where the blood was sprinkled. Now, we're gonna delve further into this. We're going to the tabernacle next week. It's gonna be a two to three week study. It really just depends, the Lord leads. And so depending on um, when I start writing it, probably tonight or tomorrow, um, however he, produces it is how we'll walk through it. So in the next couple of weeks, we're walking through holy ground. So I want you to think about this this week. I want you to think about all your sins and getting things right with the Lord. Okay, I'll see you next week for the Tabernacle Part 1. Thank you for joining me today.